in, uh, you, well, uh, your 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 book on the Asian diaspora and the migrations and uh, so what are your your what are your projects right now? Oh, projects now. Um, uh, well, one, one, let me tell you about an, um, it's more an organizational project than individual history, and that is to uh, gather a group together to create a world historical data set. If you think about sociology and political science, um, they have a lot of data, but most of their data is about the current moment or the last 50 years, and not so much about before. Um, and it, and historians have a bunch of separate data sets, but we don't have the data that would enable, enable us to trace the history of, of trade for the last 500 years. Even to take one key commodity, silver, since that's been money for most of the world for the last four or five hundred years. Um, why don't we add up all the figures and trace silver as it has flowed every place? Um, so, um, so I've had a lot of success in uh, gathering people in, uh, in history and then in information science because we, it'll take some fancy computer work to do this uh, to see if we can get support for creating a, uh, a large scale historical data set. Um, that would be the basis for real historical work. And it could begin with quantitative data, but you could also take qualitative data, texts, and put those into the data set and use new data mining techniques to uh, explore what the evidence that's, that's in there. Um, so there's an attempt to do for world history what's been done at the level of national history when they set up national archives and so forth. Right. No, but my other projects are, uh, one, I'm I'm finishing up a project I've been working on for a long time on African population. So this involves working with a statistician. It involves working with data on the number of people who left the African continent in slavery and then trying to estimate the amount of enslavement within the continent in the 19th century and 18th century. And just overall do the most careful job we can of estimating what African population was like from 1950 back to 1650. And I can tell you that the results that will come out of it will show an African population that in earlier times was much larger than what is now thought. That the effect of slave trade and of just high mortality in general is such that African populations grew very slowly rather than rapidly. And therefore that the African population in 1600 was at least as big as the European population then. And the African population is now as big as the European population. In between that time, the European population grew first and the African population didn't grow. In the last century, the African population grew. Now the European population is almost not growing. So been receding in some places. In some places, yeah. Well, except, on the other hand, if they'll let in the immigrants from Africa, then the European populations will grow. Okay. So there's one um, run project. Uh, I, there's an article that I'm doing called The African Diaspora and Modernity. Um, so that's um, based on my concern that all the main stories that are told about modernity leave out Africans and people of African descent. Those are stories of empire and industry and so forth, and uh, black people are included um, for footnotes about slavery and footnotes about um, emancipation and decolonization and so forth, and otherwise left out. But this is a this is a sixth of the population of humanity, and our theories have changed now, and uh, all the old racial theories of hierarchy are gone. You know, or now assumed to be basically equal in their skills and so forth. So there's something wrong with a world history of modernity that leaves out such a large number of people. And the basic answer, I think, is that too much of the world history that we do is elite history. It assumes that the changes that take place come because someone at the top figured out what change to do. So I don't need to try to take away credit from people at the top who did imaginative things. But 
rather to go and look at the family structures and the political struggles and the economic activities of black people in Africa, in the Americas, in Eurasia, slave or free, and do this narrative in terms of modernity and see if we can get it in the So, what are you reading now? What am I reading now? Um, well, I'm. I'm doing a book review on a book about uh, the Song Dynasty in China. Mm -hmm. um, Very interesting period. It, yeah, 916 to 1279, that's the official Song Dynasty. And this uh, book has relied on the wonderful documentation that they have of administrative structures um, and traces the changes in um, boundaries of provinces and counties, and makes the argument that the administration made sure to add more counties and more provinces in places where there was warfare going on, so they could collect more taxes and do more supervision of their military. And then because they had only so many people in their bureaucracy, then they have to close down some counties in other parts of the regime. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a book that shows slow, long-term change in administrative systems. Changes that were so slow that people could only have been so conscious of them, and yet when the historian reconstructs them, you see um, long-term patterns. So it's a very, it's very specific to the empire, but it ends up contributing to an understanding of a world historical issue. Right. And it's also the, the, the pattern over a long period of time. Yeah. But then the Mongols came in and took over in 1279, and they had a completely different idea of how to organize the structure. They had a lot more emphasis on big provinces and huge land grants given to the Mongol elites. The Yuan dynasty. Yep, that's that. Uh, uh, well, you're not uh, leading the, the, in Pittsburgh the a Center for World History or something? Yes, so the, center, the World History Center was created in 2008 years after I got there, it's intended to be a research center that with interest in the full range of questions in world history. Um, it's also aimed at professional development for teaching of world history, so we run teacher workshops and are interested in developing systems for, for spreading more uh, training of teachers. Uh, but we are also building up to a doctoral program in world history. Uh, I've been cautious about that. I don't think you should declare you have a program until you have enough faculty members to do that. Um, we've, um, we've just uh, hired a new uh, associate director. So this is uh, Diego Olstein at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who did a book on Toledo in the 13th century that was published in, in Spain. Um, and, but he also works on uh, political change in the 20th century at a very large scale. Um, and then we're going to hire one more person, uh, a junior person, to uh, work in ELC, what area of world history. And on that basis, we'll be ready to uh, train incoming doctoral students. While we have been waiting to start our own program, what we've done for the last two years is have a summer workshop. So a two-week summer workshop for people who are doing dissertation work in world history. Have them bring their proposal um, and present it. And then we argue it over for about two weeks. Uh, and the students, there were six one year, ten another year, for as many as twelve. Um, they, um, they collaborate, they critique each other. Um, and you get that um, sense of having colleagues in the field rather than working on your own. So, so that will continue. This will go on next year and into the future. Uh, next year we'll be at Pittsburgh. Um, actually, there's going to be a collaboration amongst different programs. And so for, you know, for those of you in, in Barcelona who are starting work, I think it's being set up so that you'll be able to rely more and more explicitly on people at other universities uh, doing similar work. Okay. Okay.
great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, finally, just um, well, uh, right, we're, we're here in Beijing, the 20th uh, annual World Peace Association Conference. Uh, what is uh, your take on this conference so far? Yes. Oh well, the conference is is a, a great success. It's the um, largest uh, attendance at a World History Association meeting. Um, so that that means I mean it's a particular attraction in Beijing. Um, most of the people here are from the United States, but there are people here from all over the world. Um, and um, so the the um, panels are more and more showing uh, strong new research. They range over a wide range of topics and times. Um, their World History Association has always had a big emphasis on teaching in the world history, and that still continues. So the, the, uh, the specialists in teaching and teaching methods are um, still um, here. So, um, and Capital Normal University has, has been the university that in China that has put most into world history. Uh, so that's that's good. And on the other hand, um, it's also the case that world history is growing in China more broadly. The trick will be increase the, the cooperation, collaboration between the scholars in China and elsewhere in Asia and elsewhere in the world. So you see but I, yeah, I'm very. This makes me happy, optimistic, mm -hmm. and it's great to see old friends when you come to a conference and you've seen you've folks for 20 years at the same conference. Here they are again. I like that. How many uh, WHA conferences have you attended? Oh, I've attended most of them. I, th I suppose I've missed three or four. I got to direct one. We had one in Boston in in the year 2000. 2000. Yeah. Um, so um, um, and. Um, you know, this one is definitely better than the one we have. That's, that's good to see that. Yeah. There's a lot of resources. <laughs> yes. Yes. Zero. Zero. Um, yeah. But also, I went to the to the NU meeting, the European Network of Universal Global History. That was at London School of Economics in April. Um, that's their third meeting, um, and that's too had a great increase in the number of participants and, and of people coming who would not previously have come to such a meeting. Um, so it's an interesting interesting time for a history profession, I think. Uh, what would you say, in a single phrase, uh, the role of the historian in society is? Ideally, <laughs> the historian uh, reviews the past critically. In a, in a way that helps people assess the problems they face for the future. Do you think world historians are much different from other historians? Um, yes. Um, I think that historians have been warned away from talking about policy and warned away from talking about the present. So there's this danger of presentism, is the term we use. Uh, where your political involvement of the present mess up your understanding of the past, you know, I understand that. But I, I think it has gone too far and that historians have been afraid to speak up at all about the connection to current issues so that policymakers pay no attention to the past. World historians, on the other hand, can never help talking about the present and the future. I wish they would do so in a more organized fashion, but you just see that they can't, in, in studying things on a large scale, somehow people can't help but speak about the future. And, and I'm, I think that's, that's, that's right, I'd, I'd like to see more of that. Sorry. Uh, Professor Manning, thank you very much for agreeing to meeting uh, with us and talking and sharing your views. Well, Ruben, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, I uh, really appreciate it. So. Well, thank you for this opportunity.